Good morning and welcome to the press conference for the 2023 Cannes Competition Entry Firebrand. It's a pleasure to introduce our guests. I'll start at the far end of the table with Oscar-nominated and BAFTA-winning film and television producer Gabrielle Tana. Among, <laughs> among her many credits, I'll single out The Dig, The White Crow, The Duchess, Coriolanus, and of course Philomena, which garnered four Oscar nominations, including Best Picture. Gabrielle. Next to her, playing Henry VIII, Jude Law, the actor. In This is his third film in Cannes. He came in 2011 with Wong Kar Wai's My Blueberry Nights for the first time. He's been twice nominated for an Oscar, four times for a Golden Globe, and in 2007, he won an honorary César, His Majesty the King. <laughs> Next to me in the role of Catherine Part, the first woman to publish a book in English and the sixth wife of Henry VIII, Alicia Vikander. <laughs> this is the fourth performance by Alicia with which she's graced the festival. She was here last year with Olivier Assias's Irma Vep, and of course she won an Academy Award for the Danish Girl. Thank you. <laughs> and... <laughs> As a director and scriptwriter, this is his sixth film in Cannes. He was here first with Madame Sata in 2002. In 2019, his film, The Invisible Life of Eurydice Gosmao, won the South Gal Prize. Director, Karim Ainouz. <laughs> to break the ice, perhaps, Gabrielle, I'll start with you. This is. Uh, a long gestated uh, project. You began even before the book was published. How did that happen? How did that come about? And what brought you to Karim? Well, I was fortunate enough to get the book in galley Could form. In the... Can you hear me? Sorry. Thanks. Okay. Um, so I was fortunate enough to read the book before it was actually published and was completely, you know, sort of fascinated by this woman. I'd studied Tudor history but didn't know about her really. Um, and um, so that sort of it began then, and then it was a process of development, and then I got to see Kareem's work, and I became sort of obsessed with trying to find something to do together and thought this was the thing. And we, I went to Berlin to meet him, and um, he'd already read the script um, and was already intrigued. Thank you. And, um, and, and then, actually, then the world changed. Then COVID happened, and everything really shut down. And we continued to work through that period of time. And actually, Kareem did not know anything about this period of history. He didn't really even know who Henry VIII was. So um, we used that time to actually do history lessons and to work with the writers. And just it was a real actual. Um, privilege and something that you don't normally get to do. So we made the most out of an unfortunate situation. And then by the time life got better, we were able to make the movie. Kareem, aside from the fact that this is your first English language project, do you see it as different from your previous projects, the fact of working on a period drama? And what drew you to the subject? I think what drove me to the subject first was the encounter with Gabi. Uh, the encounter with the great producer is um, always very special. But I think what, after that, what really brought me into the story was the character of Catherine. I thought it's one of those characters that you think, why wasn't something done about her before? Um, and I was very intrigued by her strength and by how more than this woman was. So, it's, so it was very interesting to think of a character from 500 years ago that made sense today. Um, and um, I, I think making an English language film or making a Portuguese language film, I mean, it's all about, for me, the characters that you portray. So it is a bit different. It's not my native language, but at the same time, it's a character that I felt very, very close to. So it's not that different than, um, than what I've done before, really. Thank you very much. We'll open the floor. We have a question from Sweden in the middle. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Markus. I'm from uh, One Press TV from Sweden. Hey, Alicia. Hey. Um, 
Yeah, so as I understand, this uh, movie is based on a novel, and uh, there are some facts that are based on some true events. So I want to ask both Alicia and uh, Jula to um, how much did you have to go into study your character um, to do the research of it? And um, um, yeah, talk about that. And also, did you have any chance to uh, shaping or creating your character as well? I'm Swedish, so I'll start. <laughs> um, well, yeah, like you said, because it is based on true characters, uh, there's a lot of um, information, a lot of things to go back and do research on. Um, uh, I know, well, when I came on the project, Jude had already been involved for quite some time with Kareem and um, I <clears throat> just tried to kind of catch up in the sense that they had already, I mean, a huge selection of both books, um, people that came in for lectures. Um, we had um, experts of the Tudor times who came and spent time with us who, who had lived even as Tudors uh, for, for a while. Um, and then, of course, alongside that, with the fact is this happened five years ago. so. As we know, we can't really know what happened. And that's also the beauty of creating a film like this. And for me, I was very intrigued by being part of this project after my first initial conversation with Kareem. And for him, it was the first thing he said. He wanted to make a film about a marriage, about this couple and their relationship. And then, you know, use the beautiful, like, colors and the grand, um, setting that this historia piece has, but focus on that. So a lot of the preparation was the conversations that we had in rehearsals, trying to really understand um, the relationships and how these two people um, come together. I can't really add to that. <laughs> <laughs> the same. Lots of reading. I think the thing that surprised me was the more I read, the more I realized all the history books had the same facts and the spaces in between were interpreted by each historian differently and it suddenly was liberating that we were able to interpret it our own way, that the facts remain the same, but there are all these ambiguous, wonderful moments where you have to just imagine. And we feel like we know these people because of portraits and because of the stories, but it's a long time ago. Uh, so it felt like a space that we could create. Question on the left. Hi, I'm uh, Thomas Orzer from uh, L'Essentiel in Luxembourg. Um, first, congratulations for, for your wonderful performance. It was uh, amazing. Uh, I got a question for Jude Law. I would like to know um, how it is, what is the sensation, the feeling of playing such a monster like Henry the Haves? How did you prepare yourself? And then for Alicia Vikander, Basically the same question, how did you, did you prepare yourself um, fronting this horrible character? Thank you very much. It's always interesting when you have the opportunity to reflect and talk about an experience of making something, because in, in many ways you pass through it and you don't get to really honestly um, consider it until you're a year, sometimes more later. And obviously, that's a really good question, and a lot of people have asked that. But if I'm really honest, first of all, you, you know, I never, th I, 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 I couldn't be responsible for considering him a monster. He was, I had to understand him, and we always wanted to make sure he was rounded and plausible and contradictory, but, but fully considered rather than monstrous. And indeed, he is monstrous, but that wasn't my job to sort of judge him as such. And, um, the playground that we worked in was, had to be safe, and it, was, it felt very safe, it felt very brave, it felt very collaborative. Kareem is brilliant at creating that kind of atmosphere, and Alicia is a wonderful uh, uh, playmate, like a friend and a, and, a, and a partner in that situation, and was incredibly brave and fearless. And it always felt... <laughs> This made me laugh. My memory is that we laughed a lot, which sounds really twisted. 
because of course we did <laughs> awful things to each other. But my memory is that we were laughing a lot. Yeah, uh, I mean, it was a... I think we had to. We, yeah, <laughs> I think we knew what the task was. Yeah. And we were very aware of it. Mm. And then you kind of have to approach it with some, si some sort of lightness, mm. I think. Um, mm. Yeah, and for me, <clears throat> yeah, I play this character that I realized quite quickly, including myself, when I kind of read up on her. She's, you know, pretty extraordinary, the things she achieved. She was known to be a good mother, the first woman to be published under her own name. Um, but again, I also need to make a grounded, complex, um, multi-layered, real human being. Um, one, one of the things that I found pretty incredible, uh, and this is considered, you know, you know, it's 500 years ago, and as much as we know it, that it's mostly men and kings that are kind of acknowledged throughout history to then actually have that this character that I'm going to portray, she does have these books that you can actually go and read, and they've been translated into more modern English. And then not only I, I get like a real... You know, I, I listen to hear uh, to her own voice, and also knowing that it's a woman from 500 years ago was a pretty extraordinary feeling. And there, I feel like I got, you know, got to p pick up real nuances, and and that's where my kind of fa fa fantasies and inspiration really started to bloom. I think. Thank you. Question in the middle, I believe. It's me. Good morning. Uh, Teresa Corsero, um, German television, Kultur Zeit, ZDF Freizeit. I have a question uh, for Karim Ainus. Um, I was wondering, I mean, this story starts before the British Empire, but later it, it, it began. So um, the fact that you don't, uh, that you come not from an empire state, you come from a colonized country. I was wondering if this had an impact on the way you wanted to tell that story. Uh, it's a really good question. It really did. One of the, one, one, I think also one of the reasons to do this film. I come from both sides of my family, from countries that were colonized by Europe. Um, so when I was flirting with the idea, part of it was also the wish to write history from this perspective. You know, like there's so many histories that are written. It's almost like there's, his, you know, histories are written by men, and, and that's what we say in the beginning of the movie. And I was really excited to, to be able to, it just felt really interesting to think about somebody coming from where I come from, writing about the place which was going to become an empire. And what was really exciting is that the year that the film takes place is exactly about 45 years after Portugal invaded Brazil or, um, come, you know, entered Brazil for the first time. And I was really, really um, excited by the possibility of looking of how England was. And, and the truth is, it wasn't the England that we know today. I think that the England that you know today is very much framed by the sort of Puritan Victorian framework or, or image. And I, and I was really interested to look at England. I was talking to a historian and thinking, what is the equivalent? What would be the equivalent? You know, if we talk about Europe today, what state would England be? And he said, Albania. It was, it was an island. It was not in continental Europe. It was not the kingdom that it became after the rule of it. Colonialism begins with Elizabeth. So for me, it was really exciting to look at that time. And it was a very different England. And I do think the other thing that was exciting, it felt very Latin to me. I know it was not Latin, but it was like based on gangsters and you know there was a lot of gold and there's a lot of colors. So for me, it was really exciting to and interesting to make a portrait of that country that would become a colonial empire. Um, and yes, it was a big attraction to me. Wonderful, thank you. Yes, please. Hello, Florence Angeles from W Radio in Mexico and Colombia. Uh, bon. uh, first of all, thank you for this film and all the, the cast is very, very grateful to, to see this film. And my question for you, we are uh, used to see you in the um, character as seductive charm. And this time is you're a horrible king, <laughs> a cruel uh, king. How did you uh, choose this, um, this character, why did you see yes to Karim, and uh, how did you uh, work on, on your character? Yesterday, I saw uh, the King Henri, uh, but uh, not Jude Law. Thank you. Um, 
I think the first conversation I had with Kareem was very liberating in that he made it clear uh, that this, we were going, he wanted to look at this uh, from a very human perspective. So I felt free of the uh, restrictions of history, I suppose, and the uh, history books and even the sort of portraiture. It felt like I, I was allow, allowed to, or the right place to start rather, was to start as a man and what created this man. And so many of the layers of him and his behavior and, and the abuse I think he received as a child, meaning, you know, to be separated from family and almost uh, brought up under guard uh, to be a king and um, fed the lies that he was, you know, second only to God. I mean, what does that do to someone? Uh, and when you add to that the paranoia of the time and then also the physical um, heart, uh, um, the physical uh, 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 frailties that he was carrying and how he dealt with those, it suddenly became a very, um, a very, uh, not, not recognizable, but a very uh, um, empathetic person to me anyway. I felt like I, I could understand him. Uh, so to answer your question shortly, I think I started with him as a boy and as a man really, rather than as the historical figure that we all know. Thank you. Yes, please. Oui, bon, bonjour, Gérard Chargé de Sinizouk. Juste, juste un instant, je vais laisser le temps aux gens de, de... Non, non, juste de mettre leurs écouteurs pour la traduction. Uh, the next question will be in French, so if you need a translation, we have the headphones. Good. S'il vous plaît, monsieur, pardon. C'est pas grave. Gérard Chargé de Sinizouk. Alors moi, j'avais une question Cinezoom. pour les deux comédiens. I have a question for the two actors. Qui va s'étendre aussi aux au, au réalisateurs. The question also applies to the director. Est-ce qu'il y a eu des difficultés particulières, Were des scènes qui ont été plus difficiles que d'autres, et Were comment some vous scenes avez more difficult than euh, others? réussi à faire abstraction de ces difficultés pour réussir aux réalisateurs et aux acteurs qui ont réussi à faire cette magnifique résultat? Pour le directeur, quelle était la plus grande difficulté quand il s'agit de l'éditer et de sortir avec ce um, film? Um, should I answer in French or do in English? Um, I have a very short memory for bad experiences. I tend to forget them. So <laughs> I'm not sure if I think of something that was difficult. I think it was perhaps as a whole, it was really important to me that we're not doing a movie about a royal family, but it was a movie about a family. So I was being aware all the time that these people, I was looking at them horizontally and not like that they were above me. Um, and then technically speaking, I think it was, it, was really def it was really interesting to bring life into a place that was sort of a, a beautiful palace, but that had not been lived in. So it was how do you bring life and how do you breathe life um, to that place, which was not a museum exactly, but it was a place that was not being used to be as a home, not, not, not used as a home. And then there's a, the third point is, there was a scene which was really complicated, but technically as well. Now emotionally, which is the scene um, when they're celebrating um, May Day. And that for me was, it was really challenging to, to do something that captured the energy of that moment without also looking at it as just a spectacle and, and seeing that the characters were there. Having fun, but probably there were other moments that I'm not remembering now that um, that were difficult. But um, yeah, there was a question for the actors at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, same. I think. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of difficult times, and I also have a hard time to come up with any. I think it's you know I more think about like challenging moments uh, in the sense that. You know, we spend a lot of time to try and get, you know, under the surface of these characters. I mean, f personally for me, it was, um, you obviously, you know, I, I tried to, when he spoke, uh, what he just said about it being about a family, you know, it always helped when I kind of could put myself, you know, try and imagine, you know, what if this was set today, this, you know, situation, because I don't think human behavior or emotions have changed over 500 years. And that thing when we started to rehearse and I realized, okay, so this is a woman who walks in and she 
is married off without uh, her own, uh, um, without having any say in it and knowing that there's five wives that are dead, you know, and just putting yourself in that, you know, state of mind that really, you know, changes things. And, and, and that's, I think, where I realized how fragile each moment is for this woman, how she is so terrified of anything because anything that she does wrong can make this man, you know, flip. <laughs> and um, and then, then seeing the few historic facts that we could go back to and then knowing what she actually achieved, and especially with her writing and her, like, hope for enlightenment and knowing what his, you know, ideals were, that she managed to do that whilst also being just a woman who managed to survive day by day, I thought was just pretty you know, spectacular, incredible to imagine. Thank you. Jude. Yes. Do you have anything to <laughs> <laughs> How difficult. I like it. <laughs> it's a really odd uh, and rather wonderful kind of push and pull scenario when you're working on something like this, because on the one hand, you're incredibly happy and fulfilled and stimulated because you're doing the, the, the thing you love and you're in, a, you're in a, a, an incredibly safe place and you're challenged and uh, working with people you admire and, and, and in many, many ways you're having the best time of your life, but you happen to be investigating stuff that's awful and dark, and, but you go home going, great day. That was a great day. Uh, so it's an unusual scenario. It's a kind of dance that goes, I guess, of being an artist. You, you've got to go there. You know that the shadows are the place where the work is the most interesting, the dark spaces, but you do so safely. And thank goodness you can get out, right? You leave. But you have to do so honestly, because otherwise it's not worth anything. So it's a kind of, it was a, it was a, it was a sweet spot of a, an experience for me, um, because I, I, I felt I was able to go there with the right people in a safe way, but um, I, I was having a great time. You talk about it being able to leave it behind, but certainly coming back into the present at the end of the day, a present uh, marked by Me Too, by misogyny, by despotism around mm -hmm. the world. How distant is this world from 500 years ago? <clears throat> no, I think that's, you know, I mean, we had those moments when he kind of like, you know, talking about making these big, difficult and horrific scenes whilst having good, good it kind of hit us mm. while we were making some of these scenes, really when it was just the two of us and, you know, Jude, you were pretty, you know, wonderfully terrifying. <laughs> and, you know, it was those like very sensitive moments when I really could deep down. I mean, it's the beauty of the work that I do. I get to put myself in situation and, and imagine together with other people in a space and it becomes very powerful. And then you can get the chance of like, get a sense of, whoa, okay, this is what it could be like for a person who is in this situation. And I do not, I don't think there's any difference from being there 500 years ago to today. Gabrielle, you were nodding. Yeah, no, I think that's what drew me to the story in the very beginning, you know, um, and I think that's right, and that's what's exciting about it, and that things are timeless. Thank you. Next question on the left. Hello, Rana Moussaoui from Agence France Presse. I have a question for uh, Jude Lowe. Um, since you delved so much into the history of Henry VIII and the history of uh, the monarchy, and there have been so much talk about the monarchy recently, I mean, especially with the coronation, etc. I would like to know, I'm curious to know, what is your take on the British monarchy? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I kind of see it like theatre. Um, although I'm slightly more obsessed by theatre. I don't, I, I don't really follow it. 
I find it as a chapter in history kind of intriguing, how it relates to itself, if you look backwards. But I'm not one for gossip. I don't really enjoy it. Uh, I find no interest in it. And I don't really enjoy following tittle-tattle stories. And um, But there was something remarkable about looking at the photos of this medieval ceremony and how it applied to today. Mm -hmm. Made me feel very modern. <laughs> Alicia, what about the monarchy in Sweden? Um, I actually, they, they, it was, um, no, I think, I think they've had an upswing in Sweden over <laughs> my time there. Um, I think, I think, I, you know, <laughs> I agree with Jude on most things that he said. But yeah, I've, I also don't think that I, I, I don't know. I, I don't follow it really myself. Thank you. <laughs> question on the right. Okay. Hi, uh, question from Estado de São Paulo, uh, Rodrigo Fonseca, question to Karim Ainuz. Watching this Game of Thrones of Game of Thrones of yours yesterday was a bless, but it was, especially after the Bolsonaro nightmare that we have in Brazil, but it was impossible not to think about a crime committed against a woman from Brazil, Dilma Rousseff. Yeah. Uh, the coup d'etat against Dilma started the nightmare. I would like to hear from you, Karim, if you brought any reference from Dilma to this story. Thank you very much. Yeah, just to give a bit of context, Dilma was the president that was um, ousted before Bolsonaro was elected. N not really, I mean, I think that it was very strange because this film started um, exactly when he was elected. And now thinking back, maybe there was other reasons. You know, it's funny when you make some choices and then you realize that there are other reasons behind them as well later on. I don't think about Dilma, but I think a lot about the fact that I was making a movie about someone which, who was a bit like Bolsonaro um, without thinking about it. I think it was my way to, um, to deal with it. I mean, I hadn't been back since I was never in Brazil while he was in power, and I think that this is probably a way that I found. I mean, of course, there's other references for this character in, in the modern world. We don't need to go much farther than the US or Russia or Turkey. But I think unconsciously there was a lot there in my mind that I was trying to deal with um, when I was making a portrait of a king slash dictator slash monster uh, that had to do with the times we're going in. In a country that had been, in, you know, it, it's been a democracy, but like the election of somebody from extreme right wing makes you think, what is a democracy? Um, more than, so I, I was thinking more about that than, than about um, Juma. Thank you. A question on the left. Hello, uh, my name is Gabriela Bravo. I'm from Culture des Arts de Chile. Uh, je ferai ma question en français. Mm. I'll put my question uh, in French. I have a question uh, for Karim Maynouz. Vous savez, um, dans votre film, vous désacralisez complètement film, la figure du roi. Vous le montrez comme un homme. Uh, you portray homme, uh, the king uh, par, uh, as a man who's malade, eaten away by jealousy, uh, who is sick. Je savoir, uh, si I'd like to know whether you think that kings still have a sacred status. What do you think about the monarchy? Um, it's, it's puzzling to me. Um, it's 2023. And I think a monarchy makes sense when you believe that people have blue blood, right? Because then it makes them not human. But at the moment that you believe that don't have blue blood, it, it, it just, it, it's like what Jude said. It's a theater, and sometimes it's an interesting theater. And sometimes it's not that interesting, depending on how it's played. But um, I think what was also very exciting for me to do this film was to exactly not think of any of these characters as, I mean, of course, the character of Henry is a very violent man. And the character of Catherine is somebody who was trying to resist that man. But for me, that's, that's all it was to me. I was never thinking. And then there was a moment, it was a, it was a strange moment in the, in the shooting that I said, my god, there's not a scene with a crown. Like, how do I put this in the movie? You know, because you never see him wearing a crown. And I thought, this is a big mistake, Kareem. Hello. And then I thought, oh, OK. So you know, so we, we had two scenes where we actually saw 
you know, that Catherine is on the throne, a crown and throne. And then there is a scene where Henry is, is wearing a crown. Uh, but for me, it was something, I, I was really interested in the mythology of this period and, and, and what it meant and in the theatricality. So the film has this kind of Baroque theatrical value to it because I think that's how monarchy is played out. But I was much more, as I was saying before, I mean, really what, what really made me want to do this was to think that, yes, things were very similar from 500 years ago, but also things are very similar in a positive way and in a negative way. And the positive way is women like Catherine did exist 500 years ago. Um, so patriarchy was always there, but I think that for me it was the discovery of this woman who was extraordinary and who was very, very, very modern, um, you know, in 1546. Karen, we've been talking about the theatricality, about the iconography, uh, the art direction, the costumes are thrilling, amazing. There's so much energy that comes from them. I'm wondering for the actors, putting on these costumes, was it crushing? The weight of the costumes, was it liberating? Did it give you energy? They're liberating getting out of them by the end of the day, yes. Um, no, I mean, I think for me, going into your first costume fitting is one of the most pivotal times in me finding out, you know, realizing whatever character I'm doing. So when you do a drama like this, obviously it's this sensatory, you know, it's very helpful. Obviously you put this on and you also get um, uh, the routine and the ritual every morning, which is a reminder <laughs> of what it actually was for these people to put it on. I mean, and, and the wonderful uh, costumes were, I mean, done exactly as how they were back then. I had like seven, eight layers. It's a 30 m minute, you know, uh, preparation in the morning. Um, but then it was wonderful. I mean, we had talked about it a lot and I had Kareem like yelling across the room, like disrespect the costume. I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> was like, but he was like, lie down, roll around. <laughs> and that was, you know, uh, that was the thing. I think, again, we have this kind of idea, what he talked about, the kind of Victorian ideal of like what you, how you should wear, what you, sh uh, how you should talk, how you should walk. And that's kind of our view of have, having seen these paintings too. Um, whilst when you're in them and you get the image of, you know, for me especially when one of the lecturers has said, you know, in the palace it's like 300 men normally and then it's like 10, 12 women in these two rooms. And I was like, that gives you kind of a, you know, a, a special image. And then being in these dresses for all that time in these tiny, tiny rooms. And that was us hanging, you were like, stay in there, <laughs> you know, <laughs> hanging on there. And then after a while you do start to slouch, you, it's human behavior. So you, you do that, you like lie on the couch or on the floor with these dresses because there's really nothing else you can do. <laughs> do you have anything to say about your costumes yeah. or prosthetics? It was, um... Again, it was a wonderful sort of contradiction from the beginning in that we had the brilliant Michael O'Connor uh, who found these historical uh, milliners who made everything uh, accurately, historically accurate, which meant we could dress and undress and, and not have to hide anything underneath. Um, so there was this attention to detail and respect to the past, but then there was also, as. Uh, Alicia said there was this disregard in that we wanted to live in them, take them off, trample them, wear them like you would uh, take off a hoodie at the end of a run uh, and undo them. And, and um, again, as Alicia said, that, that stepping into them can't help but affect you. And especially for me, the silhouette of Henry is like Father Christmas, you know, you know it immediately. You don't have to see any detail. You go, oh, that's Henry VIII. He's square, and he's got the hat, and the... So, so he gave, the costumes gave me an awful lot uh, to work with, um, especially in volume. <coughs> they helped a lot with size. Yeah. I read that you, um, on set, brought certain smells to make <laughs> the uh, scene more realistic. Were you allowed to bathe during shooting? Was I what? Allowed to bathe. 
<laughs> I did sometimes. <laughs> we, well, there was, I read these uh, several r interesting uh, accounts that you could smell, Hen at this period, you could smell Henry three rooms away because his leg was rotting so badly. Um, and he hid it with, 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 with rose oil. So I just thought it would have a great impact if I smelled awful. And um, did. I went to this brilliant perfumier who is really, by the way, I mean, she makes wonderful scents, but she also makes awful scents. And, I, and, I, uh, and, I, and she somehow managed to come up with this extraordinary variety, which was pus, blood, fecal matter, <laughs> and uh, what was the last one? Sweat. And uh, initially, I used it very subtly. I just sort of thought I would use it myself and that that would have an impact. And when Kareem got hold of it, <laughs> it just became, it. It became a spray fest. <laughs> And a lot of the was... reactions you see, I hear him going. <laughs> we literally have like Still, film now, sorry. Like, camera operator. Yes. Who's like, hurt him. That's right. <laughs> I have an image of a boom off. That's why I go. When they, when they left the set to eat, I would come in and and spray the whole room. Like his, every room had a smell, and it was like incredible. Like it really triggered a lot. But it was when he walked on set, it was. Just horrible. <laughs> <laughs> to get away, but then it was wonderful. You remember the scene when he goes into your room and they're checking your linens? No, I remember. Like, and she was like, I couldn't believe she was so close to him. <laughs> no, but it was wonderful to use that, right? I mean, you brought this, and there was yeah. this little box with all these scents that we started to travel Didn't around. Didn't know and that anything could, could smell like could smell so <laughs> bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Gabrielle, there's a potential marketing tie-in. <laughs> <laughs> Firebrand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Henry's stink. The we best stink the in the world, yeah. Question on the far right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 me? Oh, hi. Uh, Lena Bassi, Hollywood Foreign Press. Um, uh, congratulations to your movie. Uh, actually, I am old enough um, re uh, remem to remember seeing um, another movie uh, in a cinema, Carl, uh, uh, no, Henry VIII and uh, his uh, six wives, which was two, uh, two uh, hours long. And uh, 50 years um, later, you ma managed uh, to make a movie two uh, hours long about uh, Henry VIII and his... Um, last uh, wife. Um, I'm just wondering what kind of movie did you watch during the preparation? What kind of books did you? All right. Just to say, I think it's not a movie about Henry VIII. It's a movie about Catherine Parr, but Henry VIII is in it. But anyway, it's about the couple. Um, and I think that was the first thing that was interesting to me. I did watch a lot of Russian films. I was li really looking. There's a, there's a director called Alexei Herman who did a movie called um, It's Hard to Be a God, um, which was really, really inspiration to me. I was really looking at films that looked at history and at the past. They were not glamorizing. They were not um, sort of looking at the past in a nostalgic way. So I think this was one really important film. There's a film that actually won the Palme d'Or, I think, in 1973, called The Tree of the Wooden Clogs, which is a wonderful film that has a very, very tactile quality. And you know, you just believe that these people are really living there. And then I watched a lot. I rewatched um, quite a lot of horror films. I watched Carrie again. So I think it was a mix between, you know, I watched The Shining, the sort of classic horror films that take place in one room. So in one hand, I was looking for the energy that was a very contemporary a genre energy to make this film, um, because I really, I mean, it's, I don't see it like a drama. I feel it's, it's a thriller more than it's a drama. Of course, it has, you know, dramatic elements, obviously. But yeah, I was looking at a lot of Eastern European, um, and as I told you, Italian and Russian um, stuff that um, really inspired me. Uh, there's a film called Faust by Sokurov also that uh, I think is a movie from 2011 that was really very, there's a lot, there's a lot of wetness in it, which I thought it was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Because I think when we look at the past, it, it's normally very dry because you can't really shoot in places where you can put water. And I think those films were films that really dealt with humidity and environment and an atmosphere that I was trying to get here. Thank you, we have a question on the left. 
Hello there, congrats on the movie, I enjoyed it. And uh, my question is for Mr. Jude Law, but I think maybe you other guys could also answer it. And when I went into the movie, I don't really read a lot of it, so I didn't know you were in it. And I didn't recognize you until halfway through. I was like, shit, I know him. <laughs> and I've been wondering if you might have walked on set and you had some encounters where people really didn't recognize you in your costume. While we were making it? Yes. Um, I don't, I don't know that that happened, uh, but I'm really, well, yeah. Uh, no, I don't know that that happened on set. Um, but it was a very interesting process working with Michael, who we talked about before in costume, and Jenny Sherker uh, in uh, hair and makeup to try and find something authentic about our Henry, as we kept calling him. Um, without prosthetics. We used a prosthetic for the leg because obviously the wound had to be active. Um, but it, it felt more of a sort of organic place to start that we... There's an awful lot you can do by changing hairline and face growing beards and... Teeth. Teeth and, yeah, all sorts that, that have an effect on who, what you look like. Very, very, very subtle. Uh, not, 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 I think, brash sort of um, changes can often stand out in film. And also that we wanted the flexibility to be able to really perform rather than live in rubber, you know, and wear a mask. Mm -hmm. And um, because the starting point was very much, this, this is real, this is a fan, this is a, a couple, it, it didn't feel like we had to um, create some sort of uh, mimic of a portrait. Um, which we all have, but like I said before, it's remarkable how familiar the silhouette of this man is, and so you do have to do very little. I, re I remember after the first, like, the severe haircut that she gave me and the beard I had, and kept thinking, oh, is this working, is this working? But as soon as I put the hat and the clothes on, it was like, oh, no, I'm Henry VIII. I mean, it's <coughs> unmistakable. There were people that visited the set that did not recognize him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they, they didn't talk to me, so... No, <laughs> you, yeah, but, no and Kareem doesn't have people talk on the set, no. so... <laughs> <laughs> the dictator, right? <laughs> they came with about a dictator. No, not really that. <laughs> that <kind of> thing, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was also very interesting, because I don't think I've seen you during the shoot that much outside of the set, so there was f also, for me, this magic of only seeing um, Henry VIII. <laughs> All the time. Henry. <laughs> I hate to play the despot, but I'm afraid our time's up. Thank you all so much Thank for bringing you. us to film and for coming to the <laughs>